ready on the handling matter. Let's take up first the uh, the uh, motion that you have filed to uh, file additional or supplemental brief. I'd like to hear you on that motion. Good morning to the board. My name is Craig Sandlin. Uh, I filed a motion uh, to leave to amend the appellate's brief and alternative or additional leave for rebriefing. Uh, I also, the state bar filed the reply. I filed the reply to their reply. And what we'd like to know, I think, Mr. Sandling, is um, we, we see your motion, but it did not attach a proposed supplemental or amended brief. And what we're wondering is what point do you intend to raise in a supplemental or amended brief? Um, I... I had planned to not only correct the form in which the brief should be in, but I had uh, additional points to bring up regarding uh, due, uh, due process argument uh, regarding whether the board is a, uh, a judicial body pursuant to the Texas Constitution as it relates to uh, having the power um, in these circumstances to, um, to uh, disbar me without going before a judicial body. And further, I was going to bring up issues regarding uh, some of the things that were complained of in my motions for a new trial and motions of um, motion to uh, for rehearing that all were denied. So I think what I'm hearing is that uh, you want to first correct the form of, of the brief. Uh, I, I recall your brief raising an issue as to the uh, constitutional construction of this body uh, and whether it's a judicial body which would be uh, not a new point. Mm -hmm. Are you raising any new points? I think I'm hearing that you're raising points that were not raised in the original brief that might have been contained in an underlying motion for new That's trial. correct. That, uh, Mr. Berry, have a response? Yeah, I, we would just say that I don't think it's appropriate. Mr. Sandlin has had, um, since this case was originally set three months ago, he said an additional 90 days. He didn't notify the board. He didn't notify us that he was having any difficulties or any reason why he couldn't rebrief it prior to the day. And to raise it at this point, I think it's a little late. Mr. Berry, I did not see anything in your opposition papers that suggested that you were complaining that for lack of uh, uh, technical formality issues should be a basis for striking a brief or getting no, relief. So you're absolutely correct, Mr. McKenna. We did not raise that point, and we would not. So uh, that is waived it to the extent of any formal technicalities. Absolutely. That, we would not suggest that it be, that his appeal be denied because of that reason. I think, uh, I think the board understands the points with respect to its composition and and the uh, constitutionality of its existence and function here. Uh, I believe any other points that were not raised from the motion for new trial uh, are, are not timely at this point. So we'll deny the motion to supplement or amend your brief. Are you ready on oral argument? Yes, Your Honor. All right, beginning with issue one, Your Honor. Uh, characterizing the practice of law Granted, authorities differ as to whether the practice of law is a franchise or some other type of special interest. Um, all agree that the practice of law is a specialized skill 
And while a license is not property, while, while in the state's hands, uh, notwithstanding the state's declaration to the contrary, the question whether a state law right constitutes property or rights to property is a matter of federal law, especially as it pertains to due process. As it relates to issue number two, judicial process uh, before deprivation, the order of admission is the judgment of the court that the parties possess possesses the requisite qualifications as attorney and counselors and are entitled to appear as such and conduct causes therein. From its entry, the parties become officers of the court and are responsible to it for pro professional misconduct. They hold their office during good behavior and can only be deprived of it for misconduct, misconduct ascertained and declared by the judgment of the court after opportunity to be heard uh, has been afforded. Their admission or their exclusion is not the exercise of a mere ministerial power. It is the exercise of judicial power and has been so held in numerous cases. Um, in Ex parte Garland, it, uh, and I'm quoting, we think there is no question that a lawyer holds his license during good, pay, good behavior and can only be deprived of it for misconduct, ascertained and declared by a judgment of the court after opportunity to be heard has been afforded. Regarding uh, issue three, um, due process not afforded, judicial, I mean judicial uh, due process not afforded. Neither the CLD, the evidential pa panel, nor this tribunal are prepared to seriously argue that due process in this context was afforded to Sandling before the latter was disbarred. In fact, they admit the contrary, claiming that only administrative powers are required to affect disbarment. Uh, further, um, as was uh, acknowledged by the, by the chair of the board, um, there was an allegation made by me that the composition of the grievance panel was incorrect according to the rules. The rules require that there be uh, two attorneys for every public member. And in the situation where you have an even number, then um, that would require that there would be, um, there were a total of four members, uh, grievance pa panel members. There was two public members and two attorney members. And it's my contention that the, uh, the composition of the grievance panel for that reason was not correct. Mr. Sandling, is it your position that if there had been two attorneys and one public member that it would have been properly constituted? Do you, do you agree with that? I don't think so. I don't, I, I don't agree with that, Your, Your Honor, because I think a quorum requires that you have it a minimum of four. And if you, have, if you come up with an even number, then that's going to require you to have uh, two attorneys for each public member. So if you have two public members present for a hearing, are you saying you have to have all four of the attorney members? Because the panels are six. Do you understand that? I do. And um, I think the cases that I saw that said if you had um, the fifth member was an attorney, that it didn't require you to have the total six, but you would, in, in that situation, 
So your position is three attorneys and two public members would be okay, but two and two is not. Is that what you're telling us? That's what I'm telling you. Um, let me ask you one other thing while we're on that. You mentioned due process. Can you tell me what due process was denied you? I'm not quite sure on that. Okay. Um, what I was uh, com complaining about, Your Honor, was um, I wasn't aware other than the general um, language in the rule that says the whole range of punishment is available to the grievance panel, and meaning a minimum of a private remand up to disbarment. And I wasn't aware until I came into the hearing, uh, the grievance uh, panel hearing that morning that, that the State Bar intended to proceed with a disbarment. And in, in not doing, making me aware of that, in terms of the initial election that was made, I couldn't make an informed decision as to um, whether to take a plea bargain or to go to the, in, in other words, I wouldn't have had informed consent because I, I, I didn't know until that time. Well, look, the, let me ask you, first of all, do you understand now that the range of punishment that was available included anything from a private reprimand to disbarment? You understand that now? I, I understood it. Okay, let me, did, is it your position that the state uh, or the uh, CDC should have told you that as opposed to you just knowing that? I'm trying to understand what was kept from you. Well, their, their intent to, um, to seek disbarment because what I'm saying to you is yeah, I'm making an analysis analogous to the point that it, this is a quasi-criminal proceeding. And if I were going to do a criminal case and somebody had a capital punishment, I wouldn't, they would tell me well before I walk in the court that this, the state is seeking the death penalty. And I'm saying I wasn't made aware of it, uh, that specifically they were going for that punishment. And I'm saying that takes it out of the realm. If it was just a sanction or below, I think you would be in a, um, it, it would be a different set of circumstances. But because they were going for the maximum punishment, the fact that I didn't, or wasn't made aware that that's what the state's position was now, as a procedural thing prior to the hearing being made final, I did withdraw my consent, and all that's in the record, and I asked um, the board to take judicial notice of all the things that are in the record. That's all I have for this point. Any further questions from members of the board? Um, I have one. <clears throat> Mr. Sandling, you received the notice letter from the State Bar. Is that correct when you made your determination that you wanted to make an election for the evidentiary hearing? Yes. At that time, you did not elect to go to district court? No, I did not. Okay. Thank you. Anything further? Thank you, Mr. Sandling. Mr. Barry. to the commission, may it please the board. The judgment of disbarment entered by the evidentiary panel is well supported by the evidence. And Mr. Sandling's arguments that the evidentiary panel and indeed this board don't have jurisdiction to hear the case and that the panel is improperly composed are both without merit. Mr. Sandling argues that the case must be reversed because the panel an evidentiary panel cannot exercise judicial power. He takes phrases from various cases out of context and misapplies them to create his argument. His basic argument is that Section 2 
Article 2, Section 1 of the Texas Constitution prohibits um, or because the evidentiary panel is not a court, they can't exercise judicial power. However, one of the cases he cites, which is Barshot, ironically found that Article 2, Section 1 did not bar administrative agencies from working in tandem with the judicial system to administer justice in this state. Now, Mr. Sandlin concedes that the Supreme Court has authority to regulate the practice of law. And in attorney disciplinary cases, the Supreme Court, through its inherent and statutory powers, has promulgated the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Procedure, through which um, provides a framework for complaints against Texas attorneys to be adjudicated. The State Bar Act required the Supreme Court to provide an option for a respondent attorney to either proceed in district court or through an administrative process or the evidentiary proceeding. Um, the evidentiary panel, pursuant to the provisions in the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Proceeding, heard Mr. Sandling's case. And they had authority to adjudicate the complaint against Mr. Sandling. They did not exercise judicial power. They exercised the administrative power that was conveyed to them by the Supreme Court through the Rules of Disciplinary Procedure. So it's clear that his first argument fails because the evidentiary panel did have authority to hear the case and to impose a sanction. He next argues that he, I think his phrase was seasonally withdrew his consent in his first amended motion to quash and dismiss. This argument fails for three reasons. First, because his consent was not necessary for an evidentiary panel to hear the case in the first place. Unless an attorney affirmatively elects to proceed in district court, the case is heard before an evidentiary panel, whether it's by his election or whether he defaults into that. Secondly, and in that case, and in either one of those cases, or in the case of default, his consent is not necessary. Secondly, there is no provision in the rules for a respondent attorney to change their minds after an election has been made or after they've defaulted into the evidentiary process. And even if there were, his first amended motion was not timely filed that he's claiming that where he withdrew his consent. It wasn't filed until the panel had heard evidence of the underlying conduct, had made a determination that Mr. Sandling violated multiple disciplinary rules by committing misconduct, until after they'd heard the evidence on sanctions, until after they had announced the sanctions on the record. It was at that time that he filed his first amended motion to quash and dismiss, after the hearing was over. So it's clear that he couldn't withdraw his consent, especially where it wasn't even necessary. His final argument is that the evidentiary panel was improperly composed. He claims that the panel had to have two-thirds attorneys, one-third public members, or four public members, um, sorry, two-thirds attorneys and one-third public members, or four attorneys and two public members. He's correct as far as we're talking about a six-member panel. We also have three-member panels. This was a six-member panel. What he doesn't argue in his brief at all is the quorum issue. And the rule for quorum is slightly different, um, as he's acknowledged here today. It requires at least one public member for every two attorneys, at least one. So you can have more public members for each two attorneys. In this case, we had two public members, two attorneys. And we cited four cases in our brief, including Allison, which was a Supreme Court case, which all held that a 2-2 ratio, two attorneys to two public members, was a properly constituted quorum for an evidentiary panel to hear a case. Therefore, his final argument fails, and the Commission respectfully requests that this Board affirm the judgment of the evidentiary panel disbarring Mr. Sandling in all respects. Thank Any you. questions for Mr. Berry? I just want to um, confirm that, uh, are you telling us, and I, I want to make sure from what we read here, that the withdrawal of the consent, if that was something he could do, occurred only after the uh, finding of disbarment? That was filed after the panel announced that it, the announced penalty would be disbarment? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. He, um, he filed one before that, which didn't have the consent issue in it at all, 
And then he told us he was filing an amended one, but that was not filed until after the panel had actually made their decision. What, what was the prior motion? It was just a motion to quash and dismiss. Thank you. Based on some other things. What about, uh, what's the record show on his statement today that he didn't know that disbarment was a remedy? Well, first of all, he never conducted, he never asked us for any discovery. The, the pleadings, I think, are, are pretty broad, uh, which is allowed by the rules, and it does include any um, sanction that the panel feels appropriate. He never asked us what, that, what we were seeking. Um, he's been through the disciplinary process multiple times, and, you know, <coughs> he's well familiar with the, the process. What, what is the usual practice of the of the uh, commission in terms of what penalty you're seeking? Do you have a standard practice? A standard practice? In terms of telling somebody what they're going for, we're going for the death penalty or are we going to go for life in prison? We may have settlement discussions in, in that regard where, where it comes out. Some um, respondents ask. We will generally tell them what uh, and I know we were actually we, we generally try to avoid that because I don't think it's appropriate the way the pleadings are. We have had cases where we were ordered to put something in, and we did with the proviso that you know anything can happen at trial. Something may come up, and we would change what would what would be an appropriate sanction. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Berry, Mr. Sandling. To the members of the board, um, I wasn't saying that I wasn't aware that uh, this format was available, and there were um, uh, discussions between myself and Mr. Berry, but all I'm saying is, as it relates to the possibility that that was what their first their first idea to do in terms of going forward with the disbarment, that was never mentioned. And so um, I'm saying as it relates to due process, <clears throat> when you are involving the right of, of an attorney to practice law, that, that is a, a, a more of a superior right even when you're arguing against the, the previous sanctions, the lower sanctions, from private reprimand up to a suspension of some kind, that doesn't involve taking away a person's right to practice law. And I'm saying for that reason, I think it should be dealt with differently. And in looking at federal cases in other states going is uh, it's universally treated differently than a situation where you have an attorney that possibly can get sanctioned or fined or suspended for a, a period of time or um, uh, probated uh, a suspension. So those are all treated differently. And so when I'm speaking of my constitutional right as it relates to due process, I'm, I'm, the main point that I'm pushing forward is a point that um, when you're dealing with a potential property right, the, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that person needs to have his rights considered by a, judici a judicial court. And so that is the, how I arrived at what I am arguing in relation to a failure to actually have due process. I thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Sandler? Mr. Sandler, did you uh, conduct any discovery during this uh, proceeding below? Truthfully, um, I attempted to at the end, and it was denied. 
I, I, I had requested some, and I had re requested additional time to, just to get some basic things, uh, trying to find that out, and um, it was it was denied. So it was prior, just prior to the hearing. What was your What is your understanding of why it was denied? Um, because it was too close to the hearing. Thank you. Mr. Stanley, just one final question. Is there anything in the record as to uh, what this, what the matter could have been resolved short of disbarment? Is there anything? No, I, I didn't think that, that we could do that, so I didn't raise that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandling. The board will take this under advisement and notify the parties of our decision shortly. Thank you. Thank you.